Kia ora koutou, he mihi mahana kia koutou. My warmest greetings to you all. My warmest greetings to your mountains from my mountains, to your rivers from my rivers, and to your people from my people. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. My warmest greetings to the folks from the Sri Lankan Evaluation Association and to Professor Ishida for her lovely welcome. My presentation today is going to be about 10 questions Indigenous communities should ask evaluators. And I'm presenting this today really on behalf of Eval Indigenous uh, that I co-chair. And uh, this is some of the communication that we've come up with for Indigenous communities to think through. So before I carry on, just let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from the east coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, from a little place called Mohaka. My dad's from the Ngāti Pahuera Māori tribe. My mum's Pākehā or white from a little bit south of there. I was born and raised in a little place called Gisborne, again on the east coast of the North Island. And I now live in Tamaki Makoto in Auckland. Uh, I've been an evaluator and a researcher for many years now, and for the past 20 to 30 years have been doing a lot of bi Māori, for Māori, or kaupapa Māori evaluation, um, funded by government, funded by tribes, really just working for the betterment of Māori and for Māori development aspirations. So just by way of overview of this presentation, I'm going to touch a little bit about Indigenous and tribal peoples. Um, a little bit about background to Eval Indigenous and our 10 questions and some concluding remarks. So it won't surprise many of you that Indigenous peoples are to be found all over the world. 370 million people across 70 countries, the Arctic to the South Pacific. One of the things, however, that often vexes people is who is Indigenous? And I remember very clearly a colleague of mine telling me that he was Indigenous when he lived on his home territory, but when he moved into the city, he was no longer Indigenous. So this is something that we talk about quite often, and you'll know that um, often Indigenous people are described as being first on the land. For Māori, it's about being tangata whenua, the first peoples of Aotearoa. In some places, your blood, your genes is important to finding out what race or ethnicity you are. So it can be a matter of just adding up different fractions to find out which peoples you belong to and can claim as your own. In Aotearoa, it's about whakapapa, it's about that link to your genealogy and about ethnicity, your cultural capital in, ter in terms of identifying as Māori. In some places, being Indigenous is about the history of colonisation and dispossession. It's definitely like that in Aotearoa. With that often resulting in Indigenous peoples being marginalised and vulnerable. Invariably, when Indigenous peoples live amongst others, we have dual realities. We are bicultural. We know how to function and go out to work in non-Indigenous society to get education, but we also know how to kick our shoes off at the end of the day when we come back into our homes. And one of the clearest things that uh, tells you who Indigenous people are is that they identify as Indigenous. Another way of looking at who is Indigenous is by shared values. So that again comes through as self-identification. This issue of self-determination or sovereignty or autonomy, the striving of Indigenous groups just to maintain their autonomy and often that autonomy is pivotal to their ability to fulfil their role as caretakers of ancestral lands. So if you're in Australia, you'll often get welcome to country. That it's an acknowledgement that while Indigenous people might not reside centrally on that country, the country is actually be belongs to those traditional caretakers. Shared values involve uh, a relational ontology, a relational epistemology that we know and have knowledge of our world through our relationships with one another. And the, <coughs> excuse me, UN Declaration on um, 
the rights of Indigenous people acknowledges those collective rights and our rights to not only uh, maintain traditional knowledge, but to keep on inquiring and keep on inquiring and having uh, innovative new knowledge. Another element of being Indigenous is that often we have shared experiences. And one of the clearest ways we share experiences is around that issue of colonization and marginalization. So Marie Batiste talks about European colonization and cognitive imperialism. The United Nation talks about colonization, conquest or occupation in indigenous territories. The International Labour Organization maintains that even in the face of that, we have unique cultures, knowledge systems, and livelihood strategies, and that we have distinct sovereign identities. So colonization does not define us, and it's not the most interesting thing about us, but it's often on our minds. In Aotearoa, it's often on my mind because I've been marginalized in my own home place that being Māori is no longer being seen as normal, that my territory has often been stolen, that I've often been forced out, my ancestors have been forced out of political and economic spheres and pushed to the margins of society. So there's that marginalisation of people within their own lands and often that marginalisation, as I've said, from the caretaking responsibilities associated with being the first peoples of the land. So what's this got to do with evaluation? And I love this table by Nobles, where he compares political colonialism to scientific colonialism. That political colonialism is about the removal of wealth, that just as raw materials and wealth are exported from colonies for the purpose of processing it into manufactured wealth or goods, so scientific colonialism exports raw data from communities and often it gets processed outside communities into books articles wealth and communities don't have any say in that and often don't know that that is happening that a colonial power believes it has the right of access and use for its own benefit anything belonging to the colonized people and that's like scientists believe that they have unlimited right of access to any data source any information belonging to the subject population. And the external power base, just as colonial, colonialism say the power, center of power and control over the colonizers is located outside the colony itself. Often the center of knowledge and information about a community or people is located outside of the community or people. So this is the reason why you hear stories of, for example, uh, indigenous scholars finding information about their families, their grandmothers in library books where their family never knew that knowledge was going to be put in that form. And I think we can't be naive about the role of research or evaluation in perpetuating a colonial status quo. And often a colonial status quo that sees the perpetuation of the marginalization of Indigenous people. So we shouldn't be surprised if Indigenous peoples are sceptical, are reluctant, are sometimes angry when we show up as evaluators in communities. So an evaluator walks into a bar or an evaluator walks into an Indigenous community. We shouldn't be surprised, actually, if there are tears, recriminations, because communities often hold a, a historical knowledge, or often a recent historical knowledge of the damage that uh, evaluators and researchers have done. So we shouldn't be surprised if communities have trust issues. Eval Indigenous as a network uh, is dedicated to promoting the existence of Indigenous evaluators, the rights of Indigenous communities to have evaluation and evaluators who get them, who understand uh, their worldview, who speak their language. <laughs> 
And so in promoting Indigenous evaluation, we've been doing a lot to try and speak back to evaluators, to funders, to development agencies. And in the end, um, in terms of trying to gain some traction, we thought, why don't we speak to Indigenous communities as well? And promote to Indigenous communities some questions they can ask when evaluators show up to evaluate an initiative in their community. So what we wanted to do was really prep Indigenous communities. And we're not saying that these are the be all and end all of the questions that can be asked. We just wanted to say, hey, you have a right to ask evaluators some of these questions. You have a right to an evaluator who understands who you are and what you're trying to achieve. So let's just work through some of these questions. The first two questions that we've proposed for Indigenous communities to ask evaluators are, who do you know in my community? And what do you know about my community? So when our network members, um, John and Serge Eric, went to Colombo in 2018 and then was escorted to meet the King of the Veda people, the Honourable Wanila Alfo, they had guides with them and they had been informed about the protocols of meeting and greeting. And so they were primed to uh, have a little bit of knowledge about how to behave respectfully within that context and meeting um, those peoples. So our questions um, that Indigenous communities might want to know the answers to are, as evaluators, what relationships do you have in my community? Who do you know? Is there anyone on your evaluation team who comes from my community? And when you have a guide, will you be guided in to meet and greet respectfully and uh, be escorted so that your behavior is polite? What do you know about my community? Uh, do you know the history of our community? Do you understand what marginalizes us? And do you get our worldview? So the whole thing around, do you know where we've come from? How we got to this place? Who we are? How many we are? How we define ourselves? How we talk about ourselves? And do you understand what our aspirations are? what we see as well-being, how we want to flourish, what holds us back. And mostly if I was to emphasize one, one thing that, you, that uh, Indigenous communities can ask is, do the evaluators they're working with understand that we are sovereign people? Questions three, four, and five, where are you from? When you go into a community, are you prepared to share about yourselves? Do you know your cultural standpoint? Do you understand that how you see the world is just one worldview and that other people have another worldview? Have you ever worked with a community you don't belong to? How did that go? How did that community find you? So what are you giving of yourself in terms of coming into this community? And it's essentially a question about your ability to be self-reflexive and to share and to be in a position where you are willing to learn from that community. Question four, do you speak our language? Can you truly understand a people if you don't speak their language, if you're reliant on an interpreter? Question five, do you know about the history of the initiative? So much of evaluation happens just at that point of how successful is this initiative? But shouldn't you want to know if that community had a say in that initiative? We know about the many wells that have been dug in Africa that stand abandoned because communities didn't want them, haven't used them, and actually had other priorities. So how is the initiative you're there to evaluate and positioned within the priorities and needs of that community? 
What relationship will you have with us during this evaluation? So an Indigenous community might like to know if they can give evaluators advice. Are you open to taking advice? And will you become a face that is known within our community? And by this we're saying, will the evaluators actually show up? And will they show up for both formal and informal occasions? So will you just be there in the community, seeing how we live, getting to know us, or will you only come in where there are questions to be asked? Will the people in our community get work in the evaluation? Will evaluation funding be spent locally? One of the very first evaluations I was involved in, we came to an Indigenous community and said we want them to find people who could help us do interviews, that we wanted to put as much of our funding into that community and we wanted to build the capability of people in that community so that next time when we came back to do an evaluation, they'd be there for us and actually be able to step up and do more. So our idea is always to make ourselves redundant within that community. And part of that question is, will our time and effort be compensated? So even if that community is not working in your evaluation, how will the time and effort that they put into supporting the evaluation be compensated? And will we have a say in the design of the evaluation? Is it pre-formed before you even get into that community? Or can you go into the community and let them have a say? and what's going to be measured, how it's going to be measured, who's going to measure it, how much can they expect to be involved, and, if, and manage expectations if there is no involvement. Be upfront and tell them, and let them choose then whether to continue in that relationship. The ninth question is who will be analysing the evaluation findings and writing the report? We often do what we call meaning making um, meetings with communities. We, we started off calling them sense making, but we realised that sometimes there's no sense to be made and we'd rather make meaning. Where we go back to communities and ask them to collaboratively um, work with us to make meanings of the findings. And then, if possible, we like to send the draft report back to the community. And we actually, if people in the community step up, we like to give them an opportunity to be to co-author reports. So the question is, who will be analysing the evaluation findings and writing the report? Will you be seagull evaluators who swoop in and then take those findings back to your office to do solo work? And how will you support us to use the evaluation findings? So often evaluators, the report that's written is just for the funder of an initiative or the funder of an evaluation of an evaluator, whereas actually communities need to be supported to implement those findings. So first, in order to implement the findings, the findings have to be available. Will the communities ever see you again? One of the major criticisms that we find is that communities go, what happened? We saw them, but we never heard from them again. And how will communities be supported to make any changes that are needed? Is there follow-up for communities in response to evaluation findings to make changes to an initiative, to adapt and to innovate so that, that initiative is refined to even further meet the aspirations the community might have. So as I said, these 10 questions aren't the be all and end all, but they really start with those reflexivity questions, the knowledge that you have as an evaluator. And I must admit, to go into an Indigenous community as an evaluator requires a lot of courage and care a lot of self-knowledge and knowledge of that community and, the gu and seeking guidance and going in with an idea that you're going to collaborate with that community and have a relationship with them. 
and that's important to actually invest back in those communities. And when that happens, there's opportunity for evaluation to be indigenous centered, to be responsive. And actually Linda Smith talks about when that happens, there's an opportunity for evaluation to make a positive difference. And it's a positive difference for indigenous peoples. That's not just about them changing, not just about them going from being in a place where an initiative makes them better, but actually change that's about social change and recognition that the barriers to indigenous well-being are often structural rather than personal, and that systems need to transform. It's about privileging indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of being, and actually valuing that, valuing indigenous theory, valuing the empirical research that indigenous people can do, and building that into our evaluations. It's about building evaluation capacity so that more and more Indigenous people can be involved in evaluation and be involved in evaluation that upholds community aspirations and sovereignty. And one of our elders, Hirnemokong Mead, in a slightly um, changed rendition of his quote, it says Indigenous evaluation processes, procedures, and consultation need to be correct so that in the end, everyone who is connected with the evaluation is enriched, empowered, enlightened, and glad to have been part of it. And that includes the evaluators. Just as um, Indigenous communities are on an evaluation journey, evaluators working with those communities should be on an Indigenous knowledge journey, coming to know and build relationships with Indigenous communities that they're working with for evaluation. Everyone getting to know everyone else a little bit better and knowing that there's so much more to know. So being more than a, uh, a tourist within Indigenous communities, being a visitor who becomes a face that is known and having a long-term relationship with that community, with those indigenous peoples. When that happens, the status quo gets challenged so that there, in, there can be indigenous outcomes. There can be um, outcomes about positive indigenous participation in society as indigenous and indigenous participation in indigenous society. There's indigenous autonomy and the recognition of that and the upholding of that within evaluation. There can be vibrant indigenous communities. So the strengthening of that vibrancy and the, the shoring up and strengthening of family well-being, the spreading of indigenous languages across many domains and the practicing of indigenous culture, knowledge and values, regenerated indigenous land bases, uh, tuck and yang say decolonization is not a metaphor, it's about the return of indigenous territories. There can be the guaranteed access for indigenous people to a clean and healthy environment and resource sustainability and accessibility. So all these things and many more can come from indigenous centered evaluation practice that can, can come about from the provocations of these questions that can be asked by indigenous communities and well answered by indigenous evaluators who want to be in relationship. So kia ora for that, thank you. For those who are wondering where the a picture for this webinar came from. It came from our Eval Indigenous um, session with Eval Partners in Bishkek. So I really want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you today and I sincerely hope that some of what I've said will help you think more deeply about your evaluation practice and experience the joys of working in partnership with Indigenous communities. Kia ora.